Friends, before we invite Jonathan up to share God's word with us, I would like to offer a prayer that we may understand Scripture. O oh God, as we turn to listen for your word, send your spirit among us, open our ears to your truth, open our minds to your challenge, and move our hearts to live out that challenge in the name of Jesus Christ, your word may fled, made flesh. Amen. Friends, please join me in welcoming Jonathan. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. The Word of God. Well, good morning, everyone. It is such a gift to be with you all and to share this time with you this morning. I want to say thank you to Pastor Chris and your whole leadership and congregation for welcoming myself and my family, my wife Cindy, uh, to be with you today. Uh, and I'm wondering if we can start our time together with a question that I was asked every time I entered into a seminary class, my Church History 1 class at Azusa Pacific Seminary. We would walk in and the professor would immediately ask us, what time is it? That's my question for you is, what time is it? And of course, you could say it's almost 11. You could say that it is fall. It's November. We're getting close to Thanksgiving. What time is it? And of course, that question always meant something more. It meant, by what time are you hanging your life around? What is the clock or calendar of your soul that tells you what's important, what to think about, what is meaningful in this season? What time is it? And if you ask me that question, I will emphatically say that it is week 10 of the NFL season. <laughs> and my Raiders are on by. They have the week off, so that means they can't hurt me this week. <laughs> I'm not at risk of disappointment. And if we go around the room, I'm sure we hear other things, right? It is Veterans Day tomorrow. Or for some of us, it's Veterans Day sales this weekend. If you're at George Fox, maybe you're wrapping up the semester, you're in school of some kind, it's finals. <laughs> It's almost winter break. There are these calendars and clocks by which we organize our life around, and even our own liturgy invites us into a season right now where we turn our attention towards certain themes of hope, of peace, of joy, to welcome in the birth of our Savior soon in Advent and Christ our King Sunday. And in our own traditions, as the cornucopia tells us, we're turning our attention towards gratitude. If you ever wonder what time of year it is, the only thing you have to do is walk into Hobby Lobby, right? <laughs> if you walk into Hobby Lobby right now, you're immediately bombarded with images and sayings and signs and decorations of thanksgiving and gratitude. Give thanks. All who gather here, right? Gathering, imagery. If you walk outside, even creation is telling us what time it is. Now, my family and I have been in Oregon for four years. This is our fourth fall. We came here from California in 2020, and we woke up on October 1st, so right as fall was making its way here, and it was magical. Because coming from California, around this time of year, it is the hottest month of the year. Really paradoxically, you want fall to come, so you're busting out your beanies and your flannels, and you're just trying to will it into existence. But everything outside is telling you it is 92 degrees, and that is not a good idea. So when we would go to a pumpkin patch, right, around fall, we would want to get in the spirit and drink some cider and, and see the, the pumpkins and the fall leaves. We didn't have the Redberry Barn or the, you know, Hoffman Farms that we have here, all the good options to, to celebrate. We had to go to a mall parking lot <laughs> in Laguna Hills, where literally on a tarp outside of a Macy's, there would be about 16 pumpkins and, and pictures, poster boards of fall trees. And we would try as hard as possible as we're sweating in our beanies and our flannels to just get into the spirit. <laughs> because while it was typically time to turn our attention towards fall and gratitude, it didn't match our experience. And the same can be true for you today, where everything around you, everything 
in our liturgy is inviting us to turn our attention towards gratitude, joy, peace, and love. But maybe to you, our passage today, to rejoice, to pray, to give thanks, feels like sweating in a California parking lot because it doesn't match your experience. It doesn't match maybe what's going on in your heart or in our world. How can we turn our attention towards gratitude when, depending on who you ask, the dust is still settling or the confetti is still falling in another divisive and contentious election cycle? How can we turn our attention towards gratitude when the rubble still falls in Palestine, Israel, and many parts of the world? When the quality of life for our neighbors and maybe for ourselves and those we love continues to plummet, how can we turn our attention towards gratitude the question sometimes when we read a passage like ours this morning is, how dare you, Paul, ask us to rejoice, to pray, and to give thanks in circumstances such as these? And if it's finding you in a challenging and hard place to do those things, to enter into gratitude, then the good news is you're not alone. As a matter of fact, the very first receivers of this passage the people of God in Thessalonica, would have had a very similar response. The church in Thessalonica, the Thessalonians, whom Paul is writing to in this passage, were in a region not too different from our own. It was around a port city, and it was a hub of not just commerce and trade, but it was under the shadow of the empire. The military used it, so it was really significantly influenced by Rome and Greek ideologies and agendas politically. It was also a, a trade post for culture and ideas. And so it was a, a region bustling with the status quo, the Pax Romana, the way the world was at the time could be found there. So when Paul and Silas and many other companions of the church go and establish a Christian community there, they start to live differently. They live counterculturally as a community, embracing the message of Christ. They start to do some really challenging things to the status quo, like caring for the poor, welcoming each other across different social stratas and across differences, gathering around Christ's table, embracing each other as brother, sister, sibling. And doing so, living differently with their money, differently with their allegiance and relationship to empire, differently with their spirituality, it is not just odd, it is actually threatening to the culture and the norms around them to the point where this Christian community starts to face persecution and suffering. They start to lose some of their social standing. They start to lose some of their safety. They're in a season of suffering, of, of, of loss, of turmoil. And they write to Paul and they say, hey, what time is it? <laughs> How long until that day you told us about, that day when the Lord will return and free us from this suffering? How long do we have to wait? When will Christ come and make all things new and right again? How long, O oh Lord? Which could be the question that you carry into worship today is how long, O oh Lord? Must the world be the way it is? And must I face the things I'm facing? And Paul writes back to them and back to us today and says, that's not the right question. The question isn't how long or when will Christ return. The question really is how will we be found on that day and every day until then? How are we to live in the meantime, even when facing hardship? Who are we becoming in Christ as we are people of a one day, when one day things will be made right? How are we living today? So in this passage, this is Paul's kind of landing the plane message to them in this letter, and he's saying a, a litany of encouragements and a way to live as a Christian community facing hardship in a difficult season, and he has the audacity to say, rejoice always. Pray without ceasing and give thanks in all circumstances. So the good news is that this is not a message to us ignorant of our tribulations, of our suffering, or that of the world around us, but it is one directly to it. It's an invitation for us in the midst of all we face and grieve. What I would love to do is walk through this passage kind of one at a time, looking at each of these calls that Paul puts before us and explore them together. Is that okay? 
Well, the first is this, to rejoice always. Now, this tells you a lot about your relationship to joy. And and I have to confess that if this passage would have found me last year, rejoicing would have felt impossible. While our first fall here in Oregon was magical (laughs) compared to a sweaty parking lot, last fall was the darkest and hardest time of our lives as uh, my wife was enduring a high-risk pregnancy, needing to be ambulanced over to the hospital for week-long stays at a time, back and forth waiting for diagnosis and bed rest orders and navigating whether or not we'd see the finish line of that pregnancy. In the midst of that, receiving a life-defining diagnosis for our unborn son and grappling with our expectations of what that would look like for our lives if we could get to welcoming him into the world. And finally, this whole scenario led to uh, an emergency C-section in an effort to save Cindy's life and our son being born two and a half months early, meaning 75 days in the NICU, back and forth every day, wondering if we can bring him home. And I only describe my winter as fall gave way to a bitter and cold winter in more ways than one to just remind you of your own. And I'm sure we can fill this room with those stories of those times, those seasons, and some of us are in the middle of them, of hardships we've faced, of tears we've cried, either for ourselves or for our loved ones. And it's in those times that rejoicing, rejoicing feels impossible. I had to reorient my relationship to what it means to rejoice in the Lord. My greatest teacher in that time was my three-year-old daughter, Bella. We've come to call her our pilot light in that time because the sun and the warmth and the light of good days felt way far behind us. But we were warmed by just the, the subtle pilot light of her joy. Because if you ask her about those times, all she knows is that her brother came early. And the incredible ministry of the nurses and the doctors to set up for her in the corner of his NICU room, a a place for her to play with toys and coloring books and snacks. And she would come in every day and say, good morning, Luca. And wouldn't know if this would be the day to bring him home, but she would talk about that day when she'd be able to play with him and they'd share a room. And seeing her joy, not knowing if we'd ever bring him home, seeing him fight for his life, It didn't change how I felt. It didn't undo my grief. It just reminded me that joy still exists and that one day it could be found again. Because when you're in the hard chill of a dark night and a winter that feels unbearable, it doesn't mean that the sun doesn't exist, even if you can't see it. But being people of a one day rejoicing doesn't always mean cheering up and putting on a happy face just to save face socially. Rejoicing sometimes means trusting that even though you can't see it, joy is at work in you. Just because you can't see the sun doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And one day it'll come again because we are people of the one day. And we rejoice not because our circumstances are favorable, but because in all circumstances, Christ is with us. Our joy is found in God with us and God on the way. And it's hard to live with the grief and the joy simultaneously. And it's okay if you can't maybe be so expressive in your celebration of that. It's okay if what joy looks like for you is just a subtle trust. A subtle leaning, a subtle resting in the Lord. And as I learned in that season, it's okay to borrow joy. And this is what it means to live in Christian community together is sometimes we become a pilot light for one another. And it's okay to borrow the joy of one another and be warmed by just the subtle recognition that Christ is with us and we're not alone until that day when we stand fully in the light of Christ. So Paul says, rejoice always. And then he says, 
and pray without ceasing. I want you to notice your first response to that phrase, pray without ceasing, because that tells you about what you think prayer is. And for me, I actually remember the first time I heard this. I was about seven years old, and I grew up in a Spanish Pentecostal church in Greeley, Colorado. And I heard, pray without ceasing. And immediately I looked over to what we would call the hermanas, the older women of the church who were known for their prayers. But their prayers were very expressive and really passionate. And I could still hear them in their prayers today. Gloria a Dios, aleluya, amen. Gracias, Señor. I remember hearing this passage and thinking, I can't do that all day. <laughs> Pray without ceasing. <laughs> and I've come to really appreciate that part of my spiritual tradition. But to think about doing that in the midst of the NICU felt impossible. What I realized in that season, that what I thought prayer really was, was a performance. I had to muster up. I had to pray in a way that was exhausting. Or the other way I saw it, as I found out in my darkest days, was prayer is like writing for a city permit, a petition to city council. It's got to be to the T. You can't make a mistake to get what you want. Prayer is a negotiation to get what you want or what you need. And there are forms of, of intercessory and petition prayer that have their place in the Christian life. But when we are invited to pray without ceasing, it has to mean something different. It's about praying with all of you, with your whole self. Even in dark times, prayer often looks like bringing your grief and your lament to the feet of Jesus. A teacher of this type of prayer for me is Mary of Bethany. If you read the scriptures, especially the gospels, you'll see Mary of Bethany, Mary, the sister of Martha, the brother, or the sister of Lazarus. This family that was really important to Jesus' ministry, every time he was in the region of Bethany, he was hosted by this family, and they were close. They were really relationally close. And the gospel authors, especially Luke and John, do something really significant with the way they use Mary to tell us about discipleship. Every time you see Mary, she's at the feet of Jesus. And this phrase, at the feet, was a, a, a phrase well known amongst the rabbi discipleship, disciple relationship. It's like if I were to say standing at attention. Immediately, if I say standing at attention, you know what that looks like, but you also know who tends to stand at attention, right? A soldier waiting for a command. So the phrase, at the feet, was a way to describe somebody who was a disciple of a rabbi. So, well, oftentimes the, the 12 disciples are missing the point of what Jesus is doing. The gospel authors will bring Mary in to demonstrate, often without words, what discipleship actually looks like. The first time we see Mary at the feet of Jesus, she's listening and learning even as her sister critiques her, right? We see her again at the feet of Jesus in John 12, anointing Jesus as king and, and using her hair to, to, to wash his feet because she knows what he's about to do on the cross when nobody else seems to get it. But another time that we see Mary is at the tomb of her brother Lazarus. When she had called out to Jesus, her and her sister had asked Jesus to come and heal their brother, but he doesn't. So as Jesus approaches the tomb, John tells us in chapter 11 that Mary runs to Jesus and falls at his feet. So immediately we're meant to lean in and see this is what discipleship looks like as she's at his feet. She runs and falls at the feet of Jesus and she grieves. She brings all of her personal disappointment and grief and lament about her brother and her loss where it should be at the feet of Jesus. She says, where were you? Had you not been here, this would not have happened. In one simultaneous prayer, she tells Jesus both, you are able and powerful. You hold power over life and death. But also, I don't see it. Where is it? And I wonder what tombs you are standing by today 
of lost expectations, of unfulfilled hopes, of fear, of grief? And could you, maybe prayer without ceasing today looks like bringing that to the feet of Jesus? Not trying to avoid it and file a petition or put on a performance, but to fall at the feet of Jesus and say, here's my grief. I trust you with it. Here's what I have. In that uh, season in the NICU, prayer could not be a performance or a permit. Even though with every diagnosis and every test and every result we were hoping for, it felt like waiting on bated breath like Mary and Martha writing to Jesus saying, are you going to come this time? And I can tell you that almost every result was not the one we prayed for. And the question was, what do you do next? Bringing that Even that disappointment to the feet of Jesus is what it means to pray without ceasing, meaning to pray continually through every emotion, every outcome, every moment, every experience are grounds for prayer. Because how does Jesus meet Mary? Not with a dismissal or an ignorance of her situation, but this is where we find the the shortest passage in Scripture, right? Jesus wept. Jesus meets Mary's tears with his own. And we know what comes next. Again, resurrection is around the corner, but it doesn't negate this opportunity to bring our tears to Jesus and find his own with us. So to pray without ceasing is to change our relationship to prayer, to be this communion with God throughout all of our experiences. It's to see prayer as this place where we dwell with God. It becomes not just an act of trying to push our agenda forward, but it becomes an altar to lay down all that we hold and everything we have. In that time last year, I was really disappointed with God. I felt personally betrayed like Mary. But I can't explain how I also felt held. Prayer became a place to have silent conversations of being held by God through the passing of the storm. So to pray without ceasing, you don't even need words. You can look upon your circumstances and offer those to God. You can fall fervently at his feet and present your grief and your lament for the world Or you can, as Jesus says, consider the birds, consider the lilies. It's about noticing everyday moments as just as sacred and holy as the one we share today. And finally, Paul's third charge is to give thanks in all circumstances. In all circumstances, offer gratitude to God. And for this one, I had to turn open my science book and, and consult with neurology because it actually turns out that gratitude is a powerful, powerful tool in the human brain. And science is catching up to what Jesus in Scripture has said, that we can actually be transformed by the renewing of our mind. When you practice gratitude, even as simple as just writing down something you're grateful for every day, three things you're grateful for, your brain in the prefrontal cortex starts to change. And it increases the sensitivity towards positivity in your life. Have you ever like not noticed something and then you see it one time and then you can't stop seeing it, right? Like, do you know how many red cars there are in my neighborhood? I didn't until we got a red car in the house and all of a sudden I noticed there's five red cars in a row in my neighborhood and there's seven total. I can't stop seeing red cars. And the same is true with gratitude. When you intentionally choose to give thanks, even for the smallest things, your brain, the neuroplasticity of your brain starts to reorient the neural pathways and says, oh, we look for positivity. We look for the good in the world. And you start to see more of it everywhere you go. So to give thanks in all circumstances is a way to sustain you through the hard times the cold winters, the dark times of your life. 
And while it could take everything in you just to name what those circumstances are, what those gratitudes, those, those thanksgivings could be, it's enough for the Spirit to meet you even in your own brain and wire you towards the goodness of God. There's a version of that story of last year when we were bringing Luca into our lives that is so painful, and all of that is true. There's another lens by which I can look at it, and I can remember that while my wife was on bed rest, the, the, the tree outside of our window that filled our space had bright red leaves and was our own burning bush reminding us of God's presence. I could tell you about the nurses that we just could sigh relief when they were on shift with us because they held a ministry of presence that just, we felt the care of God. Or the Uncrustables peanut butter and jelly sandwiches that they had every Thursday in the family lounge and how that became a Eucharistic moment with my daughter. It's Thursday. There's Uncrustables. Turning your attention towards gratitude trains you to see more of God's presence, God's subtle working in the world and in your life, and it tends to grow the light around you. It tends to grow your trust, your joy, seeing you through. But gratitude also has this other effect on the ACC part of the brain, and don't ask me what that means, but you can look it up. The ACC part of the brain is responsible for social connections and relational trust. And what they found in recent studies is that practicing gratitude increases your empathy towards other people's suffering. Meaning that when you choose to give thanks in all circumstances, not only are you sustained, but you become a more spacious, welcoming point of love for others in their own suffering. And this is a good time to remember that Paul is writing this letter not to be read individually, but it would have been like our moment today. It would have been read like a letter to the church. This is a charge to a community on how to live and endure hard times together. You are meant to rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and give thanks in all circumstances together. Because not only is it your way through the hard times, but it is our witness to a lost and weary world. That when they see us in every day, no matter how hard the day, rejoicing together, praying together, however that looks, and giving thanks together on our hardest days, that's when we proclaim that we are people of the one day, when Christ returns and makes all things new, all things right. And in the meantime, we rejoice, we pray, and we gave thanks together no matter what. Let us pray. God, we long for that day. Every part of our liturgy speaks of you as a God of justice, as a God who lifts the burdens that weigh us down, we struggle sometimes to turn our attention towards gratitude and joy when all we see around us is pain and hardships and all we feel within us sometimes is hardship as well. But you write this to us, God. You give us this message, not unknowingly of what we hold and carry, but that every part of our hearts where it feels impossible to rejoice or to give thanks, you stand at the door and knock. Lord, I pray that whatever parts of our hearts and our lives feels like joy doesn't belong or we can't give thanks, we'd recognize that as new opportunities to receive the gospel once again in a whole new way. And I pray, Lord, for this community that they would learn to be each other's pilot lights in the coldest, hardest, darkest days, would they learn to borrow joy from one another? Would we fill our gratitude journals with the names of our brothers, sisters, and siblings here? And would you come soon and make all things new and right and find us faithful in the meantime? Amen.